Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Dr. Benny Long. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Bashir. Um, I thank you, all of you, uh, for coming here uh, on this afternoon. Uh, at the outset, I would like to first uh, thank uh, Bashir uh, Khan and uh, Khaled Mello and the Pakistan Canada Cultural Equation of Manitoba uh, for this very kind and generous invitation. And likewise, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Dakshina Murthy and the Mahatma Gandhi Center of Canada for co-sponsoring uh, my visit uh, to uh, Winnipeg. Um, I also want to thank uh, Bashir once again and his uh, lovely wife who can't be here today, uh, but she will be coming to the lecture tomorrow, uh, Kusum, for their very generous hospitality. You know that in our part of the country, when I say in our part of the country, I mean South Asia, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. They say that uh, you should treat a guest as a god, and luckily I've been the recipient, the beneficiary of that proverb. Uh, they've treated me very well, and thank them exceedingly. Now, uh, the uh, talk I'm going to have, it's not really a scholarly lecture, because I'm speaking in a different kind of venue, a public venue, um, and I am well aware of the fact that there are people who come from all walks of life uh, in this gathering today. Uh, can you not hear me at the back? No. Okay, I'll, I'll speak up a bit. I'm, I'm used to, I can speak very loudly, and I can assure you, because this way I can pace up and down. If I have the mic, I'm going to be constrained. So can you hear me at the back now? I'm, I'm quite certain you can. All right. So uh, let, let me uh, uh, begin by saying at the outset that this is not intended to be really a formal lecture, uh, but I wish to be able to enter into some kind of conversation with you. One of the problems with every language is that almost every word has been hijacked. You know, dialogue, I mean, it was mentioned today. And we know that there have been dialogues going on between India and Pakistan for the last seven decades. You know, you hear these phrases, ministry level dialogues, uh, joint uh, committee meetings, right, so forth and so on. Frankly, none of that has amounted to very much. Right? It has amounted to very little, if anything. So I'm very suspicious of all of these words, but nonetheless, of course, we are constrained by the fact that we have to use language. So when I say dialogue, uh, I'm also suspicious because it is a word that now has been appropriated by nation states to indicate certain kinds of conversations. Nonetheless, we must take the most optimistic view of the situation that we can. And I want to say also at the outset that when one gives a talk of this kind, people invariably ask, what is the solution to the problems that we have in South Asia? Right? And I can tell you, I don't have any magic wand. So if you're, if you're hoping to get a policy prescription from me, you're not going to get one. I don't have a policy. And I believe, moreover, that before we seek the solutions, let us understand what the problem is. Is Kashmir the problem, for example? Most people automatically assume that if you resolve the problem of Kashmir, however that might be resolved, that therefore, and henceforth, it will be very easy to have harmonious relationships between India and Pakistan. I think, by the way, that's completely fallacious, completely erroneous. And I also think that if we wait until the day that we're going to resolve the problem of Kashmir, we will have to wait for possibly another generation or two and therefore, I think that we should not be thinking just of Kashmir when we think of India and Pakistan. We should be thinking of the totality of those relationships between these two countries called India and Pakistan. Also, by way of preliminary remarks, I'm not going to say much about Kashmir, although I'm happy to take questions at the end having to do with Kashmir. And when I say that what is the problem, let me mention to you that there, is, there are a prominent number of leading political theorists <laughs> who have expressed the view that democracies never go to war with each other. Some of you might have heard that argument. So if you accepted that argument, for example, is the solution simply that Pakistan should become more democratic? Of course, that, that assumes that 
India is in fact a democracy. Some people might very well dispute that, right? And that's a very large subject. But I think it can be granted even by those of you who are not feeling particularly friendly towards India for one reason or the other, that India certainly is probably more democratic than Pakistan is. I think that that much would probably not be very difficult to concede. But let's supposing we continued in that line of argument, then is the solution simply that Pakistan should become more democratic, and if it becomes a functional democracy, then that's the magic wand, that the problem will be resolved, because two democracies have never gone to war with each other for a very long period of time. In fact, the only instance I can think of immediately, immediately really, is something like the War of 1812 between the United States and Britain, which was 200 years ago, right? So, it seems to me that we're going to have to First of all, disavow some cliches. And I beg to differ with something that was said earlier, but for example, one of the commonly held views is that the problem are the illiterate people of South Asia. They are not the problem. Every study has shown, both in Pakistan and India, and I can give you a hundred references if you want, Every study has shown that the most communal minded people in South Asia are the educated. The more educated you are, the more communal you are in Pakistan and in India. It is not the illiterate people of South Asia who are the problem. Okay. We have to be very clear. Simply making them more literate is not going to resolve the problem for us. So now what I want to begin with is with the following. The talk is called Intimacy and Distance in the Relationship between India and Pakistan. And I want to begin by suggesting something as simple as this. For those of you familiar with the geography of South Asia, you do know that the distance between Amritsar, which is on the Indian side, and Lahore is 53 kilometers. So the, those are the two largest cities and the two oldest cities, really, on either side of the border. Of course, there are cities older than Lahore and Amritsar, but I'm saying the two largest and oldest cities close to the border are Amritsar and Lahore. Lahore. Now, you know that there is a border between the two where there is a very elaborate ceremony that is held. That border is called Vaga. Okay? It's a tourist spectacle. Right? And you do know, perhaps, that the only way that you can cross the border is either on foot, either on foot, or you take the Samjota Express when it's running. It's not always running, because whenever things become hot between the two countries, they suspend the Samjota Express. And there are then these special luxury deluxe buses which can be hired on certain occasions, which, which might take you across, but you still have to do, of course, customs and immigration. However, supposing you wanted to go in your own car from Amritsar to Lahore, so what do you do? You put the directions into Google Maps, try doing it. And guess what Google Maps will tell you? It will take you 109 hours, that's if there's no traffic, <laughs> to go from Amritsar to Lahore. You would have to start from here, you have to go down all the way here, right into UP, then cross into Nepal, then go west over here, okay, into into Tibet, into northern, north of Tibet, into China, then come down south with the border with Tajikistan, and then come into what in Pakistan is called Azad Kashmir, and what in India we call POK, Pakistan occupied Kashmir. And then from there, you could get down into Lahore, a distance of 5,384 kilometers. We are so close and yet so far. Now let me put the same argument in a completely different language for those of you who are interested in literature, philosophy, and of a scholarly inclination. Freud had a very interesting idea. And that idea, he gives it a name. He calls it the narcissism of minor differences. He also uses a slightly different phrase. He calls it the narcissism of small differences. And there is a work he wrote, a master work of the 20th century called Civilization and Its Discontents, written in 1930, <coughs> where he says, he's, what is this phenomenon that he's calling, what is, 
the narcissism of minor differences. He noted that it characterizes communities with adjoining territories and related to each other in other ways as well who are engaged in constant feuds and in ridiculing each other. Elsewhere, he notes that the phenomenon is not limited to ethnic or religious peoples alone. Quote, every time two families become connected by a marriage, each of them thinks itself superior to or of better birth than the other. Of two neighboring towns, each is the other's most jealous rival. Every little canton looks down upon the others with contempt. So what Freud was saying here, let me translate it into a simpler language with some illustrations. What Freud was arguing was that the most bitter disputes are not between those who are really strangers to each other. The most bitter disputes are between those who are very closely related to each other, intertwined with each other, right? I mean, that's why you, of course, both love your family members the most and you hate them the most. You can't wait to get them off your back, right? Very often. And of course, if you look at it historically and culturally, what would be the illustration? The Shias and the Sunnis. The most dramatic illustration I can think of, an example that I've looked at quite closely, is the example of the Hutus and the Tutsis in Rwanda. And in order to ease our way into this question, I'm going to confine myself to five sets of remarks only. Five or six sets of remarks. I'm going to elaborate upon each of them. And each of them will give you a little window into how we might try to understand the relationship between India and Pakistan, and also between Hindus and Muslims. Although, let me stress that India is not synonymous with Hindus, not even remotely. We have to be very certain that we do not make that distinction, that we do not elide India into Hindus, into these one term into the other. So the questions I'm going to talk about very briefly have to do with one, with the question of Islam in South Asia. A very central question. The second set of questions will have to do with the state and civil society, something that Dr. Dakshinamurthy alluded to in his remarks. Third, the role of popular culture. What can popular culture do? And it does a lot more than any ministerial level dialogue, I can tell you, in trying to understand each other. There's a film that just came out. It's probably not been released in Winnipeg yet. I'm not sure if it has. It probably has not. In LA, it's been released. It was released simultaneously in Los Angeles as it was in Indian cities and in Pakistan, where it's been sold out three weeks in advance. Bajrangi Bhaijan, which is the latest film having to do with India and Pakistan in a certain way. Right? But I want to look very briefly at the role of popular culture. Number four, I want to look at the whole idea of the partition. The idea of the border. What is a border? What is the nature of borders? Do, do borders exist to be only guarded, or do they also exist to be transgressed? And I will explain what I mean by that. And fifthly, I want to look at the politics of sexuality, masculinity, and femininity, and what that has to do with trying to understand the relationship between India and Pakistan. Let me first begin with the question here of Islam in South Asia. I've lived in the United States for on and off for over three decades. And as you all know, and Canada, in most fundamental respects, in my view, I don't know Canada as well as I know the US, but I've been here quite, quite a few times. Uh, and I know some of the literature of Canada. I don't think that Canada, in many respects, is fundamentally different. Uh, I mean, I know that they have a nationalized healthcare system, for example, so forth and so on, something that is unimaginable in the US, because the minute you mention something like that, you're a communist. I mean, the number of, lun the number of lunatics in the US is just extraordinary, I can tell you. Right? Uh, so, you know, there are things like that, which are obviously quite different. But uh, 
when I talk about the United States, I'm really talking about North America, that after the events of September 11th, uh, 2001, the discussion about Islam began to proliferate, obviously, in a certain way, in North America, in many parts of the world as well. And to really get to the gist of the matter, one of the things that's very disturbing, forget about the whole stereotyping of the Muslim and so on, I'm not referring to that. One of the other things that's disturbing from the point of view of my talk is that in North America, there is a perception that Islam means West Asia. That Islam and the Arab world and Islam and the West Asia are synonymous. The fact of the matter is that South Asia has more Muslims than West Asia. Than Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, the Gulf states, you name it, all of them put together. If you look at India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, it has more Muslims. Now that itself is not the most significant fact. What is significant is that the development of Islam in South Asia took a very different turn than the development of Islam in West Asia. And it is my view, whether you wish to accept it or not, that what developed in South Asia is something that is really quite distinct in world culture. It is one of the glories of South Asia, and that is a certain kind of Indo-Islamic cultural synthesis, which is to be seen in the art, the architecture, the literature, the music, the cuisine of all of North India. If for those of you who love Indian classical music, I can tell you that Bismillah Khan, the greatest Shanai player ever, that every morning, before beginning his recitation and his sadhana, his practice, every morning he went to the Vishwanath Mandir in Banaras, every morning, and Alauddin Khan, one of the other great musicians, was a devotee of the goddess Saraswati. How is that possible? Does that make them less Muslim? There's a, you see, this is what we need to start thinking about. So when we think about Islam in Pakistan, Bangladesh, India, we have to think about the fact that this is one part of the world where Muslims lived in very close proximity to Hindus over a long period of time. Over a long period of time. Now, what are the implications of that? The implications of that are that in South Asia, the nature of Islam took, as I said, a very different turn. And one of the problems in Pakistan, and I want to just add a little footnote at this point in time, <coughs> and that footnote is that yes, of course I share the aspirations voiced by the people who spoke before me, and that I'm sure that all of you have, namely that there should be harmonious relationships between India and Pakistan. But it is also important <coughs> to recognize that the two countries have in some significant ways drifted apart. They have taken different trajectories in some part, to some extent. All right? And one of the ways in which they have become different is that the Muslims of South Asia, and especially in Pakistan, no longer believe, for the most part. There are a good many of them who still believe, but they are slowly being weaned away from it. They no longer believe that they are also part of the Indic world. Muslims in South Asia are part of two worlds. You're part of the world of Islam, and you're part of the Indic world. And one of the problems, politically speaking, in Pakistan is a deliberate attempt to wean the Muslims away from the Indic world and to move them towards what is allegedly, but is not in fact, what is allegedly called the more authentic version of Islam, that is the Islam of West Asia. There was a reference to Wahhabism and all of that, the Salafis, so forth and so on. So let me put it in simpler language. 
since the time, especially of Zia ul Haq in Pakistan, when Islamicization started to become a real problem, since that time, the Muslims of Pakistan are slowly being weaned away towards what they are being told by their mullahs is the more authentic version of Islam, and that is the Islam of West Asia. And I am suggesting that that is one fundamental problem that we have to think about, okay? Because, and that is why I gave you the examples of Bismillah Khan and Alauddin Khan, that Islam in South Asia has always had a very different relationship with Hinduism. How does one understand the figure of Wajid Ali Shah? One of my favorite figures from Indian history, if you don't know him, Yet to know him, the last Nawab of the court of Awadh or Lucknow, and Wajid Ali Shah, <laughs> as you know, one of you know, he was, by the way, an extraordinarily learned person. He wrote in eight different languages, incidentally, you know, Arabic, Persian, Urdu. He even knew Sanskrit. Seriously, all right. Look at look at look at look at the British Library catalog and look at the works that he wrote, Wajid Ali Shah. Now, one of the interesting things about Wajid Ali Shah is, of course, he's a Shia. And the, the 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 court of Awadh was a Shia. Court, if I may put it this way, and in, at his own court, he would have the Ras Lila performed, mm -hmm. where he would play the role of Radha, not Krishna, role of Radha. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine what people thought of that. But that was possible, and it was not an aberration. That's what I'm saying to you. Or take a very different example, something that I study to a very great extent. The, India was, as you all know, under colonial rule for over 200 years. In the late 19th century, the colonial state decided that it was going to try to, this was an enlightenment kind of project. So enlightenment project means that you, know, you have this ambition to know everything in the world. And you want to catalog it, describe it, right? categorize it. So the idea was that you would, you would do a massive survey of India of its people, the languages, the flora, the fauna, the cuisines, you name it. And so they sent out these ethnographers, anthropologists, to use the other term. And when they sent out these ethnographers, they stumbled upon things that they could not understand. For example, they came across this huge community of people in Gujarat. The community is called Husseini Brahmins. <laughs> Can you imagine? I mean, when they run into this group called Husseini Brahmin, they say, what is this hybrid beast? <laughs> Either you're a Husseini or you're a Brahmin. How the hell can you be both? <laughs> but there was not a problem in South Asia. This idea that we have only one single identity. This is a very modern way of thinking about oneself. No Indian ever really subscribed to that point of view. The Mayos who live 80 miles away from my home in Delhi. All their names, the Mayos are Muslims, but all their names are derived from the Mahabharat clans. All of their names. So what I'm suggesting, shall have to completely rethink the history of Islam in South Asia because it will be something that not only will give Hindus a better understanding of who the Muslims are of South Asia and what kind of kinship they bear to them, it will also give the Muslims of South Asia an understanding that they cannot view themselves simply as part of the Muslim Ummah. They are a part of the Muslim Ummah, but they are also part of the Indic world. And that is the home that they've had for 1,500 years. And on this note, I just want to say one thing, which is a very complicated matter. I'm not going to attempt to explain it at length, but I should mention it now, and I'll be willing to take questions on that later on. And that is that there is a real problem in even speaking about religion in South Asia, because religion as we understand it today is basically a Protestant Christian understanding of something called religion. Okay? A religion such as Hinduism was actually shaped, transformed. So was Judaism. There's a lot of body of work on how Judaism was transformed in the 18th, 19th century, especially 
in the image of Protestant Christianity. Every religion that we have today has been shaped by Protestant Christianity to some degree. And there is no word for religion in Sanskrit. If somebody told me dharma, you look up the Sanskrit dictionary, there are 500 meanings given to that word. It's also law, culture, morality. Dekhiya, just look up a dictionary. What is the word for religion in Sanskrit? There is no word. And there are very few languages in South Asia, if any, that actually ever had a word for religion. So that's a very complicated set of issues that get thrown up by that. The second thing I want to look at is partition. And here again we have a problem. What was partition called in Pakistan in 1947? I want to ask some of the Pakistanis in this room, what is the word for what was the word that was used in 1947 in Pakistan? Azadi. Azadi. But that's not partition, that's freedom. That's freedom. That is freedom. You have answered the question. You see, there was partition. If you say partition, you are already representing the Indian point of view, even though you don't know it. Hindustan ka batwara hua. Batwara. It was parceled out. Hisse ne kar diya, it was given out. In India, they say batwara. In Pakistan, they do not call it Batwara. Pakistan ka Batwara hua. There was a division of Pakistan. That was not 47. That was 71. And they don't call it Batwara. They call it Gadari. <laughs> I, I will bet you anything. Just look up the literature. Gadari, betrayal, betrayal. The Bengalis betrayed us. The East Pakistanis betrayed us. You can only have a partition when you exist. Pakistan didn't exist before 47. From their point of view, it was independence. From the point of view of India, it was partition. That's the first problem that we have to think about. We don't even have a common language in which we can speak about what happened in 1947. We don't. There was a partition, as I said, I want to insist once again, in 1971 of Pakistan. That's a different story. And of course, it's an important part of the story because it was the nail in the coffin of the two nation theory. If the idea was that all Muslims naturally had an affiliation with each other, well, 1971 shot the theory into the ground. Right? So we're going to have to think about how do we start thinking about the question of Partition. Okay? And now what I want to do, this will get us into the third set of remarks, is I want to show you a little clip from a film that's a very bad film. But Hindi films, many of them are very bad. They're unwatchable, frankly. They're too long. Okay? But sociologically, they are massively interesting. Because no Hindi film can be understood unless you really understand the mythoc, the mythic structure of Indian civilization. What I mean by that is, you see a very film that's completely contemporary, and yet the filmmaker has gone into the deep recesses of the Indian structure and has lifted out the story from the Mahabharat or the Ramayana or the Puranic, where you have this lost and found motif, or you have siblings, brothers, sisters, they all get separated. And yet the interesting thing is that before 1971, almost before 1973 actually, no film was ever made on the partition. Almost no film was ever made in India. If this was such a traumatic event for South Asia, and the Hindi film industry was already one of the biggest film industries in the world. I mean, the 90s and 50s are a great time. 60s, a great time for the Hindi film industry. Look at, think of Guru Dutt, Dilip Kumar, Right? Any number of people. Which was a film on partition that was made? Right? The first film that explicitly addressed the issue of partition, explicitly, was Garam Hava, which was not even a commercial kind of film. It was more like an art film. Okay? And yet, I want to argue, and this will now you'll see 
how you have to rethink the Hindi film. Every Hindi film was on the partition. Vakt. If you've seen Vakt, Vakt, time, right? You have, it's a story of brothers who get separated. Amar Akbar Anthony, brothers who get separated. Divar, brothers who drift apart. It is, the parable is a parable about partition. You cannot, so it's a disguised text about partition. And all of these films were drawing upon, of course, the mythic lore of the Mahabharata, the Ramayana, right? Even the Mahabharata, as for those of you who know, I'm sure there are many here who do know the Mahabharata, but it's the Pandavas and the Kauravs. They're, after all, they're not strangers to each other. This is where Freud comes in again. They're very close to each other. They had the same teachers, right? Bhishma, Drona, so forth and so on. And yet they're bitter. I mean, the bitterness between Duryodhan and Karn is amazing. You know, right? So now, what is the relationship here? Right? I want to show you, because this gets me into the third set of remarks, which have to do with the role of popular culture. Okay, and I want to show you a clip from a very bad film called Border. I want to say some things about this film first. <coughs> because it seems to me that the assumptions with which both common people and scholars view many of these films sometimes, or with which they think about them, are assumptions that cannot be sustained. Let me give you an illustration from this film and then I'll show the clip. The problem with border, okay, few people have seen border. For those of you who have seen border, you know that this is a war film, allegedly based on a real incident that took place in the 1971 war between India and Pakistan. Now this is a jingoistic war film jingoistic, xenophobic almost, the, you know, the Pakistani is idiotic, stupid, you name it, right? Very nationalist film. However, here is the problem. Somebody will have to explain to me why, given that this film was so nationalist, why border songs were a super hit in Pakistan, super hit. <laughs> but yeah, unless Pakistanis like to be self do like self-flagellation, they like to be abused by everybody and they <laughs> delight in it. Somebody will have to explain to me why Borders songs were so popular in Pakistan. Absolute super hit. There, we have the data for it. And in fact, there was such concern about it that in the diaspora in Britain, the mom and pop shops, you know a lot of the corner shops are run by South Asians, Indians, Pakistanis. The Pakistani ones were issued instructions that they should not keep this film because it's anti-Pakistan. This is the days before internet. This is the days of DVD and VHS tapes that, that we're talking about. Right? So these Songs were extremely popular, and the film itself did very well in Pakistan, even though officially there were very few films that were screened, you know, because Pakistan's had a very complicated history, much more complicated in that sense, with especially with film screenings. During the time of Zia al-Haq, a lot of the cinema halls were torn down because cinema was seen as un-Islamic. And actually there was a time when in Islamabad there was no cinema hall at all under the regime of Zia al-Haq for a short period of time. They were torn down in many parts of the country to build sh shopping complexes, so forth and so on. Right? So now I want to show you a little clip from Border, and we'll try to understand what is happening in this clip. So let me tell you the context for the clip. The context is this is two hours into the film, one hour, 55 minutes into the film. The film is three hours, six minutes. You see what I meant? It's very lengthy. I mean, you know, you have to spend half a day. If you're going to watch a Hindi film, include popcorn break, toilet break, whatever, you know, forget about life, you know, that's all there is, right? Uh, and, and some of it is really quite unwatchable, frankly, because it's pious, sanctimonious, so forth and so on. 
um, and someone who's, uh, I should give you my religious credentials up front straight away for someone who's a strict non-believer like I am, uh, you know, watching some of these films can be really quite, uh, quite an ordeal, okay? But sociologically, they are enormously interesting. And the context here is that the Pakistani tanks are coming now, they're gonna shell a village which is on the border. Which is on the border, they're gonna shell the village. About the eight minute ka clip has sort of update here. Okay? Um, let's put it on the full screen and hopefully That's a Pakistani uh, thing. Those are the tanks. Islam in South Asia, right? The meaning of Islam in South Asia. Now I want to look at the role of popular culture. So in this particular scene, let me just read out something that I wrote about this. I gave this at a paper uh, in Israel, in Jerusalem, actually, six months ago, about how popular culture can be used to try to understand and resolve international conflicts. All right? The viewer who has been assimilated to liberal values and believes in the fundamental humanity of every person would doubtless have found scenes in order to lift his or her hopes. Perhaps the most famous of such scenes has an Indian army officer dive into the burning home of an Indian 
Muslim astride the border which has been shelled by the Pakistani army and at great peril to his life as the beams of the house wall <coughs> around him retrieve the villagers copy of the Holy Quran. This act of magnanimity elicits a wondrous look and remark from the villager or what tane kafir kahe hain and yet they call you a non-believer. The critics were less than visibly impressed by this scene. Viewing it as a feeble attempt on the part of the director J.P. Datta to affirm the secular credentials of the Indian state and its uniformed men. Right? So what is the dominant interpretation by the critics was that yeah, this is an attempt by the director to show that the Indian army is very secular. Right? Hindu Fauji has army officer hai, and yet he will save the Quran of a Muslim. So it's a feeble attempt. It's, it's basically transparent what is happening. The scene's authenticity, moreover, seems to be compromised by the melodramatic setting in which the handover of the sacred book is accomplished to the accompaniment of didactic dialogue. When the villager expresses astonishment that a Hindu army officer would go to such lengths to rescue his Quran, Captain Bharon Singh replies, Hindu, and I'm quoting the words, I'm translating the words here, Hindu. What does it mean to be a Hindu? To forget oneself, he says, and serve others, this is what is Hindu dharam. This is what is Hindu dharam. Isko kehte hain Hindu dharam. For centuries, this is what a Hindu has been doing. Now you can see what, of course, the, the secular credentials will say, ah, this is an affirmation of the idea that the Hindu is a supremely tolerant person and also has always been tolerant. Right? That's what they're going to say. Right? But I would like to suggest that audiences in both India and Pakistan would have read this scene differently. One which belies, contradicts, in other words, the widely accepted notion that a jingoistic film such as Border cannot possibly interpret it in registers, that is, in modes of, in different modes, which allow one to think both of conflict resolution and shared cultural assumptions across borders. Significantly, though the film seeks to establish Captain Byron Singh's predisposition towards Hindu beliefs at a number of points, the scene in question is an affirmation of the secular worldview. If by secularism we also mean, as is evidently the case in India, respect for all religions. Let me explain what I mean. Captain Bhairon Singh derives his secularism from being a Hindu, just as a Muslim derives his secularism from being a Muslim. In South Asia, Secularism has never <coughs> meant the inhibition towards the practice of religion. That would be the classic French definition. Okay? That's not what it means in South Asia. Mahatma Gandhi used to say that if you're a Hindu, you should pray that every Hindu will be a better Hindu, that every Muslim will be a better Muslim, not a better Hindu. That every Christian will be a better Christian, every Jew will be a better Jew, and every Sikh will be a better Sikh. That's the context. So this is what is happening here. This is not an attempt simply by the film director to show the superiority of Hinduism. I'm saying that one reason why this, pop this film is popular in Pakistan even though it is a highly nationalist film, highly nationalist film coming from India, was the Pakistani viewer understands that this scene, among many others, is an affirmation of a kind of secularism that is unique to the South Asian context. <laughs> a secularism which says that you do not become secular by repudiating religion. You become secular <coughs> by being better at your own religion and hoping that everyone else is better in the practice of their own religion. That is what is really happening here. Now this, of course, is simply an occasion for me as well 
to look more broadly at the idea of popular culture in trying to understand India-Pakistan relationships. All right? The film that came out very recently, which I mentioned, which I saw the night before I came here to Winnipeg, Bajrangi Bhaijan, is full of stereotypes. And again, I'm going to say something to you which might be difficult for all of you to accept. But I want to say it with utter seriousness. There is a liberal view that we should all aspire towards the elimination of stereotypes. I don't agree with it. I don't agree with it because some stereotypes can be productive. Sometimes they're extremely harmful. So that doesn't mean one takes an uncritical view of stereotypes. <coughs> but sometimes they can be very, very productive. Just as prejudices can be very we're going to have to rethink the way, because I'm saying this is how South Asia has actually practiced. I'm getting all of my insights from a study of how we have lived in South Asia over the centuries. I want to give you the example of one of my favorite cities in the world, Cochin. I don't know how many, if anyone here has been to Cochin, a city in Kerala. Now, one of the distinct things about Cochin is that it has a very large number of Muslims, large number of Hindus, and a large number of Christians. Okay? And yet, not a single communal riot has taken place in Cochin in 500 years. The only atrocities ever committed in Cochin were committed by the Portuguese. Who committed atrocities in everything? <laughs> I have no soft spot for the Portuguese. War criminals to the last. Right. And I'm using an anachronistic category. There was no category for war criminal then. Uh, we won't talk about the role of children work in this and that. Uh, yeah, but you, you know what I mean. Coaching never had any criminal problems. So a friend of mine, with whom I've done three books together, one of the leading figures in, in India today, Ashish Nadi, he wrote a marvelous piece called The Alternative Cosmopolitanism the alternative cosmopolitanism of Cochin. He was trying to understand why, if Cochin has the recipe for a communal riot in the making, why is it not communal In any other Indian city, if you had such significant numbers of people, especially in urban India, which is where communal riots take place, they don't take place in rural India, by the way. Another very good illustration of where education, you know, the, 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 the most educated parts of Delhi are the most communalized. Every, every study has shown that. In every way that you can think about it. Now, what did he find in Cochin? So he spent a month and he talked to the Muslims, he talked to the Christians, he talked to the Hindus. There's also, by the way, another very significant community in Cochin, the Jews. The Jews of Cochin. Now, of course, the numbers have come down to seven, literally seven people. Cochin has an extraordinary history. It has the oldest synagogue in Asia. Uh, and if you are interested in that, you should read Dayton and Katz, who are the Jews of India, who gives you a full blown account of the fact that there was never a single recorded instance of anti Semitism in India, ever. Now, the interesting thing about Cochin is that when he spoke to the Hindus, they all admitted, oh, we have prejudices about them. When he spoke to the Muslims, they all had prejudices about Hindus. Hindus are very strange things. They 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 are very strange prejudices about each other. And he argues almost anti-intuitively, it was a healthy balance of prejudices. <laughs> a healthy balance of prejudices which helped to maintain the communal harmony of coaching. Because if you told me, if anybody told me in this room that they don't have any prejudices about anything, I wouldn't believe it for a minute. I wouldn't believe it for a minute. And in fact, one of the things that happened here in coaching, when Nandi was talking to all of these people, were that one person 
in the Muslim community was pretending to be very liberal. But you know, this is a, when he when Nandi is talking to them, all the others are gathered and he says, Nani, Pato, Satongi, Hindu, Bhagavan does say Hindu are like God. Oh, the chidosti amari, I have no prejudices. Everybody laughed at him and said, This is the guy with the most prejudices, actually. <laughs> It was actually a healthy balance of prejudices. We have to rethink this kind of liberal conception. Ah, the world will be such a hunky-dory place if we all just got rid of our prejudices that we had about each other. No. Nandi is saying that, in fact, look, we have to work with the material on the ground. When we work with the material on the ground, we find that, in fact, this is part of what it means to be human. And of course, this is not an endorsement of prejudices. But it's also an understanding that prejudices are not the same across the communities and that the prejudices that black people have about white people in America are much less harmful than the prejudices that white people have had about black people in America over the course of the last 200 years. All prejudices are not equally harmful, and we have to understand the politics of such prejudices. Now, going back to popular culture, Bajrangi Thaijang is full of prejudices. Right? It's full of prejudices, and yet it's doing incredibly well in Pakistan. Just read, read up the news. Go to Google and read up the news. I mean, the tickets are sold in advance for TVs in every cinema hall. Right? What are the stereotypes that it feeds on? The stereotype that it beats on, for example. And this will now move me into point number four. So I'm using each to move into the other point. This one of the stereotypes it feeds into is this idea that the Hindu is always a vegetarian and the Muslim is always a non-vegetarian. In fact, Muslim man ke liye, vegetarian means dal or alu. You know, if you're a vegetarian, it means you eat potatoes and lentils. The concept of green vegetables doesn't exist for a Muslim. That's the stereotype. It may also be true to some degree. Certainly many of the Muslim homes I've gone to and I've got lots of Muslim friends from Pakistan, Bangladesh, and India, it is very much the case that, you know, for them vegetarian food really does mean meat, meat, and more meat. That's vegetarian food. You know, if you have seafood, that's vegetarian. You know, and yes, at most, okay, some potatoes and lentils. That's it. Now, of course, there is a stereotype about such things. The question is, how do we make the stereotype productive? Okay. How do we make it productive? And that takes me into my next question. And that is the question of sexuality, masculinity, and femininity. I'm going to address it very briefly, because I can say quite a bit about what I mean by such things. I want to start with that. Because there is a Muslim conception of the Hindu. And there is a Hindu conception of the Muslim. And this has some bearing on India-Pakistan relationship. There is no question about it. There are, site, there are army institutes in Quetta, where there is an entire unit which studies the Hindu mind. Hindu mind kya hai? What is this Hindu mind? I'm telling you, there is an entire institute in Pakistan in Quetta, and there's a research institute there, a unit of that just at there. They published papers and monographs on the Hindu mind. And in India, they're trying to understand the Pakistan mind. The right? reverse here. Now, masculinity, femininity, these notions play a great role in this construction. And let me begin very briefly by going back to the 18th century. How much time do I have, Bashir? Another 10 minutes? I know that you, we, we need to... No, no, what you want? No problem. Already. No problem? Yes. But you shouldn't give me that license because I can go on forever. <laughs> 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 you know, uh, the audience want to give some kind of value Yeah, all right. But well, we don't know anything. I'm happy for something else. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'll take 15 minutes at least. All right. And In the 1760s, a Scotsman who was in India wrote an essay which became what we call the locus classicus, the central essay in defining a whole world view, which Indians took very seriously. 
The essay is called On the Effeminacy, Effeminacy of the Inhabitants of Hindustan, 1765. What does that mean? So, for those of you who don't know effeminacy here, so effeminacy is when a man displays characteristics more appropriate to a woman. Women cannot be effeminate. Only men can be effeminate. Women can obviously have masculine qualities. They can be a coach or whatever it is, but, but effeminacy is something that only men. It's a quality that applies to men. Men who act like women have characteristics appropriate to women. Orb's argument was that all Indians, remember again, all Indians, Hindus, Hindus, Pakistanis, Sikhs, whatever, the martial races, you know, all Indians are effeminate. And partly he thought they were effeminate because of the diet, because of the climate. An argument that Montesquieu had also made in a very different way in a book called The Persian Letters, where Montesquieu divided all of the people into three categories rice eating, wheat eating, and corn eating. And of course, he thought that the wheat eating Europeans were the strongest, right? Of course, I want to know why the rice eating Vietnamese defeated the greatest military empire in the world, uh, the Americans, but we won't get into that for the moment. Right? So, he divided them into three categories. He wrote this essay. Now, Indians start to take these things very seriously. Because, of course, you have to remember, and for all the Pakistanis in the room, remember that I'm referring to all your ancestors too, because they were only Indians then, right? The question for all Indians in the 19th century was how did we as a people become colonized? Why is it that we have always been colonized? If you were Hindu, you felt you were being colonized for the last 3,000 years. Ali Alexander, Alexander came and colonized us, right? Then it was the Shakas. I won't get into the whole history of every group that came. Then it was the Muslims who came, right, from Central Asia. Then it was the more Turkish, Persian Muslims, the Mughal Empire. Then it's the British. We're constantly being colonized by somebody else. Somebody is rubbing his feet into our mouth all the time. That was the question for the Indians. Why are we being colonized? One answer was, we're not a meat-eating people. <laughs> I know, it sounds absurd. But in fact, that was the answer given in many texts. Mahatma Gandhi tells you, read his autobiography. Read his autobiography. He tells you, when he grew up as a young boy, in Porbandar, he had a Muslim friend by the name of Metab. And Metab told him constantly, yeah? Become a man. Become a man. Because he was a dogra, dogra is a verse, which was very common by Narmat, a Gujarati poet, which everybody knew in Gujarat at that time. And that dogra verse said that the Hindu is weak and is colonized and oppressed by everybody else because he basically eats rice and dal. <laughs> That's his problem. And so Metab told Gandhi, you start eating meat. And of course, Gandhi came from a Vaishnava. Nandi had an idea of eating meat was revolting to the extreme. And not only a Vaishnava family, but he grew up in that part of Gujarat where Jainism was predominant. So it was Vaishnava and Jainism, and Jains, as you know, are strict vegetarians. And so it was the Vaishnavas. So if you read the autobiography, it becomes very clear that the idea of meat became associated. Now, of course, I'm simplifying it for you, because then we would have to look at the whole culture of physical culture, you know, gyms that started developing in Bengal in the late 19th century. A lot of gyms started coming up because the Indian felt that he had to flex his muscles. He had to start exercising, become a bit more robust, change his diet, become a bit more like the Englishman. Right? And there's a large body of scholarly work on such things. Now, there are people who also argue, for example, the Gujaratis argue even today that vegetarianism is a form of morality, that all good people are vegetarians. That's a slightly example of Gandhi. I've also told them, by the way, that Hitler was also a vegetarian. <laughs> so, you know, you can, you, you can take your bets if you want all right? on this particular question. The problem cannot, however, be simply resolved by trying to understand what was the role of meat eating? That's not what I'm speaking about. It's a 
way to enter into a larger question. That question has to do with notions of masculinity and femininity in the culture. There is in India, even today, there was at the time of Gandhi, I'll tell you the example of Gandhi in a moment, but even today there is a feeling in the <coughs> Indian middle classes, I come from an Indian middle class, so I know that circle quite well. There is a feeling in India, and I hear it constantly all the time, in popular conversation, in dialogues at home, that the Hindu in particular does not have the killer instinct. Jabbi cricket match hota hai, jabbi cricket match hota hai, they always say, yeah, you know, last over mein hamesh haan jate we always lose in the last over. We don't have the killer instinct. You want the killer instinct? Go to Afridi in Pakistan. That's the killer instinct. The Muslim has the killer instinct. And you know that Gandhi said, of course, it's a very complicated statement. He said the Muslim is always a bully and the Hindu is always a coward. Right? <coughs> now, when Gandhi was assassinated, 30th January 1948, most people in India, in Pakistan, elsewhere, are under the impression that it had to do with the fact that his assassin, Nathuram Kotse, felt that Gandhi was too friendly to the Muslims. The matter is much more complex. If you read Nathuram Godse's statement in his own defense, which was banned by the government of India until 1967, it was banned. You could not hear it. What did Nathuram Godse say in his own defense? He issues a defense in his own, at his own trial. And he read out the whole statement before the court. One of the things he says is, that Gandhi was an obstacle that had to be removed. He's like a thorn that has to be removed from your foot if you're going to walk forward. Why did he have to be removed? Because Gandhi, <coughs> Godse argued, was a man who had backward views. He did not believe in industrialization. He had a critique of modernity. <coughs> Most importantly, he says, a strong nation state in our age and day cannot be led by a man who has the qualities of a woman. <laughs> now look at Gandhi, he believes in ahimsa, non-violence, this is not for mard, mard ke liye nahi hai ye ahimsa, ahimsa, non-violence is not for men. Gandhi believes in fasting, he believes in spinning, these are things that women do, God says, says. what is this rubbish? Right? How can India become a strong nation state? Look at the logic of the nation state, he's saying. It has, the assassination has to do with the idea that Gandhi was an effeminate figure who could not be a leader of a strong nation state. That is what the assassination is about. That doesn't mean that they're not fight, they're not 25 other things that are obviously factors in the assassination, you know. Including the whole question of Hindu Muslim relations, whether Gandhi was viewed as being too friendly to Muslims, etc., 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 right? And of course, it's ironic because he's being viewed as being too friendly to the Muslims, and yet, this, uh, and yet Jinnah was the only person in the world who never addressed Gandhi as anything other than Mr. Gandhi, the leader of the Hindu. So of course, Jinnah always thought that Gandhi was only representing the Hindus. He thought he was too Hindu. And the assassin thinks he's too Muslim. Right? The assassin and Jinnah, I know this is going to sound heretical to you, have very much in common. Very much in common. Because both of them represented a very provincial point of view which could not understand the kind of significant departures that Gandhi had made. In the history of the world, not just the history of India, and Asia, but the history of the world. And this is, and a point that you can question me about, Islam, I want to say absolutely openly whether it satisfies you or not, makes you angry or not, 
I think Pakistanis have to understand that you cannot compare Jinnah. You don't have to be a Gandhi nationalist. You don't have to be an Indian nationalist. Gandhi is a world historical figure. In a way, in which Jinnah is not even remotely a world historical figure. Jinnah is a figure who has relevance for the meaning of Pakistan, and he is not only Pakistan. You go to this museum here, which I went to this morning, I can tell you 50 museums. And the last thing I want to speak about is state and civil society. That Dr. Dakshina Murthy had also referred to. I largely agree with what he said, because he had mentioned that book. There are relations that people have with each other. It, it is an accepted fact, by the way, that every Indian I know, and I've heard this from all other Indians, every Indian who's been to Pakistan, not many have been, and not many Pakistanis have been to India, right? Because it's very difficult to get a visa. This idea of the passport is again a very modern way of regimenting people's movements. There was no such thing as a passport. There's a book by John Tory, which is a social history of the passport. When was a passport invented? What does a passport mean? How did people travel? You don't think that the colonists who came to North America gave on a passport. <laughs> in fact, even in the 19th century, nobody traveled on a passport. Nobody traveled on a passport. So what am I saying to you? What I'm saying to you is that we have to first understand how we shape our culture in that part of the world. We cannot understand that through the categories that have been given to us by the Enlightenment in the West. And whether it ought to be called the Enlightenment is a different question. Because the Enlightenment thinkers are also, the vast majority of them, great apologists for colonialism. And what should not be defending colonialism at all. You know? Okay? So, I, so that's a very large question, whether I would even bother to call it the Enlightenment, but I'm just using that term as a sake of convenience for the moment. Now, the question of borders is precisely this, that we have to first eliminate the border within ourselves. And the only way to do that, and this is the provocation for you, the only way to do that, I think, in South Asia, is that every Hindu, and every Sikh will have to understand that there is something of the Muslim within themselves. And that every Muslim will have to understand that there is something of the Hindu and the Sikh within them. Because we had been for centuries, even when we were fighting each other, we had always been a part of each other, a part of each other's self. And many people take the view, I'm often asked this question, that isn't it the case that the younger generation don't have the prejudices that the older generation did? Actually, I find the reverse to be true, unfortunately. I have been part of a group in, in Southern California called the Coalition for an Egalitarian and Pluralistic India. I'm one of the founders of that group. We set it up about 20 years ago. At every talk that we sponsored, we found that the older generation understood some of these things. Because even though they fought each other, even the ones who suffered, like my father, came over to India because he was born in what became Pakistan in 1947. You know? So I know from my own family what people went through in the partition. But even the ones who were bigoted, they still understood that the Hindus and Muslims and the Sikhs had, had certain relations with each other. This younger generation, in fact, are more prejudiced because they don't understand the nature of that synthesis that developed in that part of the world, which is frankly, I think, one of the, as I've said, one of the absolutely greatest contributions in world culture, what came out of the Indo-Islamic cultural synthesis, which developed over a very long period of time. It developed from the time around 800 all the way until the 1800s. 
right? So I think we live with borders, but borders exist not simply to be guarded, to be protected, they exist as a provocation to us to transgress them, to violate them. And the first border we have to violate is the border where we have set up a border between them and us. Thank you. Thank you.